Good afternoon and welcome to today's workshop on Making Progress in Diversity and Inclusivity. I'm Emily Stubbs, Policy and Projects Manager at Grace Birmingham Chambers of Commerce and this event is part of our Growth Through People campaign. The GBCC's Growth Through People campaign aims to help local firms boost productivity and grow through improved leadership and people management skills. This year involves eight free workshops along with thought leadership blog, video, podcast content, all on the GBCC website throughout March. The campaign will end with a virtual conference on the 30th of March, featuring a mixture of inspirational keynotes, thought-provoking panel discussions and interactive workshops. I'd like to thank all of our headline sponsors for their support, Aston University, BMET College and the University of Birmingham's Work Inclusivity Research Centre. And I'd also like to give a huge thank you to our speaker today, Mark Lomas, Head of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at HS2, or High Speed Rail 2, for giving up his time to deliver this session. Mark has delivered numerous diversity and inclusion projects across the UK and internationally for organisations across a wide range of sectors. He is a published author on the topic of equality and diversity. And in 2016, he took up the role as Head of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion for HS2. HS2 have since won a number of awards for inclusive procurement, innovation with impact, its work inspiring young BAME individuals, its supplier diversity programme, gender inclusivity and its work as a disability confidence employer. In, in 2019, Mark won the Inclusive Companies Head of Diversity of the Year Award and in 2020, he was named in the People Magazine Top 20 DNI Power List. Before I hand over to Mark, we have two anonymous polls that I'd like to ask you to fill out. The results are completely anonymous and hopefully might spark some ideas for today's discussions, but will crucially feed into our research into leadership and people management across the region. I'll mention it now and at the end of today's session, but please do complete the post-event survey that we'll send you a link to after this event. Um, it's not just about event feedback, it's about leadership and people management skills across the region and it informs our conversations with stakeholders on this agenda as well as what growth of people looks like going forward. We hugely, hugely appreciate every single response. And don't forget to join us on social media using the hashtag GTP21, as in the top right corner of this slide. I hope you enjoy this session and take away some ideas to implement in your own business. And please do get involved and post your questions for Mark throughout the session in the Q&A box, um, which you'll find next to the chat function in your toolbar. Um, without further ado, I will hand over to Mark Lomas, Head of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at HS2. Over to you, Mark. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, uh, as Emily said, I'm going to talk to you for uh, a while about um, how we manage EDI at HS2. Um, I'd encourage you to um, ask any questions uh, that you want as I, as I, go, as I go through and, and we'll, attempt to pick them, uh, we'll attempt to pick them up. And then we also have a couple of uh, polls throughout the workshop, um, just to give me a sense of where all of you are in this journey, and then I can tailor as we, uh, I can tailor what I talk through uh, appropriately. So if we could go on to the next slide, I'll um, I'll give you a, a quick overview of HS2. So HS2, high speed rail, London to Birmingham, and also through to Manchester, et cetera, and eventually going up, up to Leeds. Essentially, um, and I won't read all the facts and figures on the screen, you, you can see them for yourself, but HS2 is more than a railway. It's a huge regeneration uh, project and, and, and program, um, which has the ability to benefit the UK in a number of, of ways skills, jobs, employment, a business opportunity, as well as um, increasing capacity on the rail line, delivering sort of carbon and environmental uh, benefits compared to, uh, compared to car travel, et cetera, and will benefit a large number of, of passengers a day. So I just want you to, um, uh, this slide should just help you understand the context and the size of the HS2 project overall. And um, if we could go on to the next slide, I'll just talk through um, a little bit about the numbers on HS2. Currently, there are 13,000 people already working on the project. Uh, and we recently announced um, a further 22,000 jobs across the country. And at this point in time, all major HS2 contracts 
are um, over indexing the industry in terms of diversity inclusion. So those that are working on HS2 contracts are more diverse than the industry as a whole. And a little later on, I'll, I'll talk you through that. Um, if we could go on to the next slide, I'll just talk a little bit about why it makes sense for us. Um, I won't sort of repeat the, the McKinsey research, which the sort of main headlines are, are on screen there, but I'll, I'll focus on the last one, if you don't mind which is that infrastructure has a huge skills gap and diversity is the key to solving the problem. For example, uh, around 28% of the uh, rail construction workforce will have retired by 2028 before the project uh, is over. Around 1,400 engineers retire every year and far less replace them. And therefore, it's a nice position to be in, in that diversity is a solution to the talent problems, the sustainability problems that the sector has. And if we then factor on top of that, um, the potential impact of Brexit, when sort of 13% of construction sites currently are made up of migrant labor, um, there is a real kind of um, talent, labor supply, and of course, cost imperative because if there aren't uh, enough people to satisfy the level of investment, not only in HS2, but other infrastructure projects, Highways England, Hinkley, etc., cetera, um, then the cost of that supply goes up. So diversity really is a solution to the problems that we have currently around talent pool and sustainable supply of, of labor. Um, if we go on to the next slide, I'll just um, sort of um, encapsulate for you where our problem is. So this is a fun game or an illustration of a game that we, pay, we play with young people whenever we do skills events up and down the country. And it's a really simple task. Basically, we ask the kids, um, take a ball and throw it in the container that represents a career you might be interested in. And you can see lots of interest in, in technology, lots of interest in engineering, et cetera, et cetera, even in business. But look at how people are, I look, at, look at the percentage of people interested in construction and railway. That's a real issue for us. So uh, to put it in a nutshell, over the last 20 years, the sector has been rather stuck in the way it's done things. It's messaging, it's working patterns, etc. And it's relied on the talent to change in order to come into the sector. And what we've basically seen is the talent has said no. If you compare this to sort of the legal sector or financial services, we have far more people wanting to get in, into the industry than they have actual jobs available for them. We have the exact opposite issue in terms of infrastructure construction and rail and we need to change that not only the messaging and perceptions but how we actually go about um, our standard working practices in the industry in order to change those perceptions and bring in a far more diverse cohort of, of people so um, on the next slide we'll go to the first sort of poll for you and um, I'd like you to answer the three questions there um, and then we will be able to uh, I'll be able to shape our discussions which come next so I'll give you a minute or so to answer those okay so I've also got a question um, are there benchmarks to seek from recruitment companies for their ability and inclusiveness around workforce diversity and would you recommend using track record and evidence of recruitment working practices so yes, when HS2 works with recruitment agencies and companies, we request evidence around diversity and inclusion as part of um, the tender process. We also, in every active campaign, require diversity monitoring at, at each stage. There are some benchmarks um, or accreditations which are available. Um, investors in diversity is, is, is one. National quality standard is, is another. Those relating specifically to recruitment might be uh, the clear assured standard and obviously if you're looking for disability good practice um, then the disability confident uh, scheme and getting to a sort of disability confident leader uh, type level um, are, are some that you can are, use, are some that you can think about 
Um, we always test the diversity credentials of those organizations we work with. It's a core part of our procurement process. Um, and I can speak a little bit more about that later. Okay, if we move on to the, the next slide, I can talk to you, um, I can talk to you about uh, how HS2 measures our uh, sort of recruitment and, and selection. The first thing to say is we have some real challenges this year. We had corporate targets around the representation of women in the AME groups, significant uh, business demand, so a real increase in the number of people that we needed to recruit, and at the same time, needing to ensure that we maintained our, our standards around diversity and inclusion, and also the ability to deliver that kind of regular insight. So I'll talk to you a little bit about how we did it and then why it's effective. The first, um, the first sort of part of our approach was ensuring that um, we developed directorate level uh, EDI uh, targets. And that meant we were able to look at each directorate, their, their EDI actuals, the volume of recruitment, what fill rates they would need in order to set sort of targets and ambitions for them to drive towards. And you'll sort of hear this regularly from me during this session. Um, understanding the data really allows you to drive those kind of intelligence-led uh, decisions and, uh, and policy requirements. And um, I often like to say, you know, at APS2, we treat diversity and inclusion like an engineering problem. We try and find the point of failure, and then we fix it. We change the process, we change the decision making mechanism in order to bring about the results that we need. So, the first is the first we undertook modeling to make sure each directorate area in the business understood what the particular targets were for them, which was based on their diversity actuals and the numbers of vacancies that they had to fill during the year. The second part of this, and this is where um, it comes into understanding. Uh, how to tackle any disproportionate outcomes in the data. We very carefully monitor the performance of each diverse group at each stage of the recruitment process. Um, and that's something I think for, for this cohort, I think 60% of people said that they don't have data at each stage of the recruitment process. So let me just pick up on why that's, um, why that's important. First of all, having data at each stage of the process allows you to identify where the problem actually is. And I'll give you an example. Um, at HS2, um, we receive uh, a very high proportion of applications from BAME groups, but actually we could see that at shortlisting, BAME groups were dropping out at a higher rate than others. Absolutely conversely to that, we had a low level of applications from women and a fairly decent um, uh, conversion rate into the shortlisting and then um, particularly successful in that interview to higher stage where the AME groups would continue to drop off. So for us, it allowed us to focus our attraction efforts on areas where we would have very few applicants and also focus on sort of our interviews, um, our recruitment process, the decision-making process for other diverse groups to make sure that we could drive towards a proportionate set of results for each of the diverse applicant groups at each stage of the process. So that data at each stage of the process is absolutely key to doing that. The third part of that was um, a sort of integrated approach to moving, um, to making progress in recruitment. And that meant launching uh, an internal campaign called Everyone Plays Their Part. And essentially, the idea of that was to ensure that our communications teams, our HR, our diversity teams, our resourcing teams, our staff networks had an integrated approach. Every month we knew which diversity celebrations were coming up. We knew which roles we were coming up. Um, we had sought out employee video profiles and stories which were associated with those particular roles and therefore we were able to craft very particular campaigns to attract particular groups to particular roles understanding for each directorate where the actuals were where the diversity actuals were 
what the vacancies were and how we crafted a campaign to specifically enable that area of the business to meet their targets. Really, um, really fairly successful. Um, we've already um, we've already beaten our EDI target um, for for the year, and we look forward to sort of celebrating that success come the end of the financial year. But it really is the data and insights that led us there. Um, if I could go on to the next slide, um, I just want to talk about some of the uh, some of the pitfalls around recruitment. So. Um, I'll, I'll ask the question and maybe you can all put it in the chat. Um, does, anybody, does anybody know the Spanish word for bridge? I'll, I'll, if you know it, please put it, in the, please put it in the chat. I'll give you 10 seconds, 20 seconds to do that. Alternatively, yeah, Puente, excellent. Um, uh, uh, is it El Puente or La Puente? And conversely, if you know the German word for bridge, if you could put it in the chat, that would be great as well. Yep, great. So we've got we've got Puente and Brucker. Right. So no, no problem. So let me explain a little, a little bit about why I've chosen this image. So first of all, um, the Spanish. Uh, refer to the bridge as El Puente, it's a masculine word. And the Germans, Die Brücke. And when researchers went to ask a thousand Spanish people how they would describe the bridge, the Spanish said strong, sturdy, tough, resilient. When the researchers asked the Germans, which is Die Brücke, it's a feminine word, the German response was sleek, curly, elegant, etc. And um, why do I tell that story? Because the language that you use in your job descriptions is often the very first hurdle at which you begin the process of screening out potential applicants, making it attractive to some groups and not attractive uh, to others. And this is really, really important it seems um, it seems like a minor adjustment, but to do this on a regular, regular basis and to do it consistently means you have to have a process embedded in your recruitment to enable you to do that. At HS2, no job descriptions are published unless they come through the EDI team where we screen not only for gender bias, but we, um, we screen job descriptions uh, for subjective criteria, etc. So if we could go on to the next slide. Here's an example of a job description that I found um, when I came into HST on, on my, my first day, and this was for a community engagement role. So let's have a spend a little time and have a look at the criteria. Well, experienced in delivering successful engagement activity, well, that seems like a pretty core essential for the job. Managing stakeholders internally and externally, again. Okay that seems like a pretty essential requirement for the job. Experienced in the transport sector. Well, I'm not sure that's a requirement for the job. Now let's think about diversity in the transport sector. Around 21% of the transport sector are women. So already we've reduced the talent pool. Six to 9% are BAME. Again, we've reduced the talent pool. Two to 5% are disabled depending on which area of the transport sector you look at. Again, we've minimized and eliminated people potentially who would be uh, fine for the job. And then one of my um, one of my favorite ones: educated to degree level. Well, the question is, in what? How is it specifically relevant to your ability to engage in communities? Um, if you have a degree of any description. And now let's go on to desirable criteria. Strong attention to detail, dynamic, robust, kind of reminds you of the Spanish uh, description of the bridge. And my favorite, gravitas and credibility, um, which essentially uh, gives you the idea 
um, that you need to be similar to the groups you are trying to influence in order to have any credibility. Now, the desirable criteria are something I'd like to pick up on. Um, at HS2, we don't use desirable criteria. Why? Because if it's not essential for the role, it is just another thing that screens out potential applicants. So if I can go on to the next slide. If you take away everything, um, what you're left with is kind of a personality description. You're very experienced, you're educated, you're strong, you're dynamic, you're robust, and you have gravitas. Most of these things do not help you select a community engagement professional who has knowledge of diverse communities um, and can engage effectively with them. And this is the first stage at which organizations often fail around diversity and inclusion. It's death by a thousand cuts. And you'll see many organizations pump lots of money into attracting diverse groups and then wonder why it's not working or why they can't get them through pieces of the, of the process. Um, if I could go on to the next slide. So I'll talk to you a little bit now about um, blind auditioning at HS2. So like I said previously, we have data on how well diverse groups do with application, shortlist, interview, and, and hire. So we, can, we have a very big data set which we can interrogate. And you heard me say before that we treat diversity like an engineering problem of finding the point of failure and fix it. Well, the point of failure for us with a lot of diverse groups, particularly with volume roles, was at shortlisting. And we just weren't getting the type of applicant we needed. And why was that? Um, bluntly, when using CV-based selection, if it was kind of hard to tell whether the applicant had the skills or experience required, people would default to things that they recognized. We saw in the previous iteration of the job description, experience in the transport sector, for example, having a degree, a number of years experience, the more experience on your CV, the more the assumption was you'd be capable in the role. So what did we do? We decided to try and hack the recruitment process. So we looked around the world for uh, recruitment solutions, um, which would help us to remove bias from the process. And we stumbled on um, the American orchestral model, which is you audition behind a, behind a screen, much like um, if you'd watch The Voice, I suppose, in, in, in the UK. Um, and as an interesting uh, fact too, in the US, when you do these orchestral auditions, you're not allowed to wear shoes because as you walk on the stage, you can, you can hear the difference between heels, flats, and then shoes. So we found a technology platform which will enable us to undertake what we call blind auditioning. And it removes CVs and applications entirely from the recruitment process. The candidate receives an anonymous um, skills-based assessment, which is related to what they do in the day job. An example would be for accounts payable, you would receive a bunch of um, invoices. You'd receive the finance accounts ledger. And then the, the purpose of the assessment is you can find any mistakes in the invoicing and um, propose changes to the monthly uh, invoicing reports, et cetera, to make them easier for the reader to spot any mistakes, et cetera. Now we've applied this to a range of roles for graduates, for apprentices, for HR. I do all the recruitment for my EDI team through this mechanism, procurement, commercial management, uh, project management. We've, we've done a variety of roles through this methodology. And the results for diversity are pretty stunning. Um, BAME groups, um, the success rate at shortlisting jumps from 14% to nearly 50%. And for women, success rates at shortlisting jump from 17% to over 30%. So this is an example of how you can use the data to pinpoint an area in your process which isn't working, and then change the model of recruitment, change the, uh, change the method for reaching a decision. The line managers get a sort of a sheet through, which is color coded, dark green means the candidate is highly technical, technically competent. Light green still makes the mark orange on the border, red not technically competent enough. And it's not until the interview stage that the individual um, uh, is known to the hiring manager. 
It's also at that stage that we have accredited inclusive recruiters in the room. And at a certain level, um, around mid-management level, you also have to have someone from a different directorate in the interview room with the recruiter and the hiring manager. Now, why is that? Um, the, the infrastructure sector is very well networked. Um, particularly around engineering, construction, project management, and program management disciplines. And therefore, just making sure we have a disruption in that interview process with someone who is completely independent of the area but trained in recruitment is a good way of ensuring that those kinds of network relationships aren't uh, driving results. Um, I'll stop there for a minute and take any questions you might uh, have on what I've said so far um, before we move on to uh, we move on to sort of the uh, the second part. Have you found that corporate targets drive any negative behaviors? Really good question. Um, the answer is no. Um, HS2 is 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 fairly mature in terms of diversity and inclusion. We're the, the only organization accredited at, at platinum level on the clear short accreditation framework, um, uh, and we we have a variety um, we have a variety of, of EDI work. So um, no, it hasn't driven any negative behaviors, um, but that's because there is a good deal of education about what we're trying to achieve. And as I'll talk about later, it is a management competency. So um, EDI objectives apply to every single person in the organization, but particularly the management structure have additional KPIs, which are linked to performance management, et cetera. We're also very clear it's part of our leadership framework, and it's just part of how we do things at HS2. Um, I would say, though, if your organization is very early on in your journey around diversity and inclusion and if you don't have the insight, probably best to develop that insight um, because of the ability to have those data sets so which can play back to management monthly. It's very clear what the trends are, what the continuing trends are, and what things need to change. That allows us to have um, a more nuanced conversation around why we might need targets. Um, the second question, do you feel that diversity inclusion should be easier to address than in European countries? And what suggestions do you have for multi-country firms to lead this change in awareness going forward? Excellent question. I think the first thing to avoid is um, a sort of diversity colonialism, if you like, which is we set the, we in one part of the world set what diversity looks like and we tell you in other parts of the world. So I think you have to, you have to adopt a flexible approach to it. Understand which are the diverse groups, which, um, which are, are short in the workforce, what constitutes diverse groups in each area, and typically then understand what you can and cannot do around local, uh, local legislation. So it's a kind of, it's a, it's a, if you're using it across countries, you need to take more of a consultative approach and build that at a, at a sort of a local level up. Because if you impose something from one central country onto a number of others, it may not work. The definition, for example, of an ethnic minority is very different in the US than it would be in, in Germany or in parts of France, et cetera. So it is important if you've got a sort of multi-country approach to be consultative and identify what you're trying to drive in terms of diversity and inclusion. Um, and is it easier to address in predominantly English speaking countries? Um, I don't think there's any evidence that it's easier to address in English speaking countries versus um, uh, a diversity approach in a Spanish speaking country. However, it is about the nuance and how you tailor those messages specifically for specific groups. If you're using sort of English dominated um, language approaches, then yes, you may well find it ineffective in other areas of the of the world. Great. Okay. Um, if we could move on to the next slide. Um, I'll pick up a um, this next bit. I'm going to talk to you about is sort of engagement and, and and management. So if I could ask you just to answer the uh, the three questions, and then um, we'll see what the results are there. And we'll go into the second uh, part of our workshop. Good suggestion. I don't know for future polls. Yeah. 
Good point. Okay, lovely. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, I'll use those responses to frame the to frame the the next part of the the, the journey. So we've all ninety one percent of uh, ninety one percent of you have said that you're engaged. You do use engagement surveys or staff surveys to measure how your staff feel. Um, I wonder if that percentage has been lower if we ask the question um, whether you cut those surveys by demographic uh, by demographic groups. Maybe in the chat, um, if you cut your survey by demographic uh, by demographic groups and have a process for for action planning, maybe you could pop a yes or no in the in the chat just to give me a, a sort of a, a feel as to um, as to whether you do that or not. So let me let me start with um, the sort of the broad culture bit. It's important to articulate what your culture um, what your culture is trying to achieve, um, and that you're very specific about it. So at HS2, we are very specific with our management communities, with our people about our, what the HS2 culture is there to deliver. Um, we do refreshers and reinductions for all staff, and we've done that a couple of times in the last few years as we've changed operating models and, and moved to new ways of working. Um, and we conduct baseline employee engagement surveys to get to the kind of HSG voice, if you like, to understand how people are, are feeling. Um, through this pandemic, we've done well-being surveys, etc. Um, and staff engagement is between 79 and 82 percent, so very, 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 very high. Um, and that helps us drive the sort of the culture element. And we can also, um, we also manage to slice that data um, in terms of various metrics. The area of the organization, the team you're in, um, the type of discipline you're in. Um, your level of seniority, et cetera, et cetera. And I can see that a, a, number, um, a number of you do the same from your comments in the, uh, the Q&A. And it's very important that because it, it allows us to understand exactly how people are, are, are feeling. The second is around our diversity and in inclusion. And I'll talk to you a little bit about this later as well. Um, number one, it's ensuring that what we do is externally verified and assessed. And like I said, we are the first organization in the UK to achieve platinum on the Clear Short Accreditation Framework over well over 450 companies, um, global, national, and a variety of sizes. Um, and we are the first to, to get there. Um, 140 staff participate in our reverse mentoring. I've talked about our director at Target and how um, we also respond to situations of the day. And I'll talk about a little bit of a, uh, talk a little bit later about our response to the Black Lives Matter. And then typically it's also built very much into our values. So it's expressed in our values handbook. We have quarterly values awards and the HS2 values are safety, integrity, leadership, and respect. And so diversity neatly fits into a number of those. Um, we also have values weeks at HS2 where we take one of the values and we put on a number of sessions around it and regular well-being surveys as well so that we could understand particularly through the pandemic how people have been doing how their mental health is how their physical health is what their strains are working from home all the time caring responsibilities um uh, you've got school age children the sort of homeschooling etc so these are some of the ways in which we embed culture diversity and values and one of the little things that we do which is incredibly effective, is at the start of every major meeting, we have a values moment. And a values moment is a, a little two minute story, whether it be something you've experienced at work or outside work, um, which brings one of the values to life and allows you um, a short discussion on it in a team meeting. Really, the best ones really make you think. Um, and, and, and actually, they kind of, within the company, they go viral. And, and, Lots of teams want to use the same values moment. But it's essentially an aspect of nudging behavior. It keeps the values relevant and refreshed. And if we could go on to the next slide. Thank you. So um, how do we get this to work? 
Well, the first thing is, and I, and I'm, I noticed 57% of you say you have no KPIs around um, diversity and inclusion. Accountability for diversity and inclusion is very important. And at HS2, um, all of our management and staff have diversity KPIs, but it's actually a core part of our leadership framework. Diversity and inclusion competence is embedded throughout areas of that leadership framework. That framework is how we recruit leaders into HS2. And it is also used to measure their development and what they need, uh, their strengths in areas of, of, of improvement. For non-leaders, we have the HS2 behavioral framework so that when we're judging performance, you're looking at not only what you do, but how it's been achieved. However, the message is really simple, and that is, if you are a manager, you're managing people, people are diverse, and we expect you to be competent in managing diversity. We don't just do that alone, we have lots of ways that we help our, our, our people and our managers engage in equality, diversity, and inclusion. But the message is a simple one. It is a core part of competence at HS2. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Great. Um, I will, I'll pick up questions right after, uh, right after this. So um, let me talk to you a little bit about engagement. So you can see here um, the kind of HS2 staff networks. Some of them um, particularly crafted around protected characteristics, some of them around interest groups, the future talent basically picks up our apprentices, our, apprentices, our graduates. And the professional development network is kind of an overarching network um, which deals, um, which primarily is focused around CPD type of events. So um, I'll take a little pause there while I answer a couple of questions. Uh, the first one, this is an aspect we're working on at the moment, have a strategy and ideas but lack measurement and continuous review improvement. Great, well, um, then you've got an open, open field to play on. Um, and I would suggest you look at some of those hard metrics around recruitment, retention, um, perhaps grievances, etc. And um, if you run staff surveys, doing the demographic scripts and looking at the engagement from, from them. Um, that is a great response rate. Have you undertaken any particular actions or activities that have resulted in that? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely critical to that success is the you said, we did response. Um, being able to articulate that absolutely clearly is why we have those results. And to be clear, engagement has increased significantly during the pandemic. Um, and we have made it a focus of our response to that pandemic to focus on well-being, achievement of, of kind of objectives, working, in, working as teams, making sure line managers check in with their teams and colleagues um, consistently. That's been a real focus and our kind of our, our safe at heart, so our safety value and our safe at heart campaign really underpins that kind of, um, that kind of a, a, a approach. So that is, that is why our engagement levels are so high. And the third question is, do colleagues get survey fatigue? Um, they don't really get survey fatigue because the well-being surveys are very short and snappy. Um, the engagement surveys are obviously longer, but they only happen on an annual uh, basis. But no, they don't get survey fatigue primarily because the outputs of those surveys very quickly are put into action. And we can then evidence um, what people have fed back and also then um, how, we, uh, how we respond. And that sort of, um, you have to be in it to win it mentality um, is also something that our staff networks really drive. So it's not just that HS2 corporate or the, the engagement team is pushing out these well-being surveys and engagement surveys. We actively have our networks all pushing um, completion of these surveys, primarily because they understand that the feedback is acted on, the actions are put in place, and things change. So for example, um, there was a lot of feedback around um, uh, trying to manage um, the level of work with homeschooling, uh, flexible arrangements, etc. We introduced a concept called My Time over this year, which is an hour during the day, which if you're working or not working, doesn't matter, but you can be, you can you have that sort of corporate permission, if you like, to be offline. 
either to focus on a piece of, of work you're doing or just take an hour's break to refresh yourself, do a bit of thinking, etc. Not mutually exclusive with lunch hour, but just giving people the flexibility to say, you can take a break from the screen when you need it. Um, these are concepts that have come up through our staff surveys, um, and then we've responded to them. And therefore, that really pushes engagement. Um, if we could go on to the next slide, that would be great. So um, we also look at um, we also look at what works and what doesn't work. HS2 is a disability competent leader, and um, many of you may uh, recognize this sort of challenge. Many organizations have real issues um, trying to get staff to disclose a disability. And we have a sort of the, the typical disability boxes which are built into Oracle, which staff can fill in. But as an organization, we also measure um, the adjustments that are in place. And we introduced a tool called Clear Talent, which are both in the recruitment space and for colleagues at work, which allows people to disclose adjustments to us and request adjustments without saying, I am disabled. And the results are, um, as you can see on the screen, um, pretty impactful. 26% of our staff have moderate or substantial uh, adjustments in the workplace, versus only 5% that would consider themselves disabled. That works out to something like 100 people with various sort of degrees of visual impairment, hearing impairment, neurodiverse, uh, varying neurodiversity, etc. But by changing the conversation and focusing on the adjustments, not the disability, we're able to go back out to our staff and say, this year we put in place 391 adjustments. And that really builds the confidence of people to ask for the adjustments they need without the worry of saying, I am disabled, as some people don't consider themselves disabled even if they would meet the Equality Act definition. So rather than push people down one route, um, we changed the conversation, and that changed the results dramatically. Again, very akin to our philosophy around EDI. Anything that doesn't work, we look to change the process, change the conversation, change the decision-making dynamic. I'm going to go on to the next slide, please. One of the, um, one of the, uh, the benefits of that approach is that our staff network um, is really focused on how we make the um, how we make the process of getting an adjustment as streamlined as 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 possible, and our together network working with our EDI teams, our IT and the health and safety teams, um, took the data from Clear Talent on adjustments and looked to um, shorten the time between people requesting adjustments and getting all of that in place. And again, um, it resulted in a really streamlined IT process, um, a new inclusive technology catalog, and higher thresholds for sign off for line managers so that we can make the process as seamless as possible. And again, because it's, uh, because it's a sort of collaborative approach which includes our staff network, um, these sort of improvements are fed back out to the business and form a kind of virtual uh, a virtuous circle, if you like, where people can see we're taking their support needs seriously and we're doing our best to implement them as quickly as possible. Um, if I could move on to the next slide. Um, again, our, our onboard network, or, or, uh, which is LGBT plus focus. Um, this is, uh, I love this picture. This is um, HS2 employees at, at, at Birmingham Pride. And, um, HS2 got our contractors together and we made a, a sort of statement about the construction industry at, at Pride, which was also linked to our community engagement stands with our, with our jobs, information on the project, et cetera, et cetera. Um, construction rail is not known for being particularly LGBT plus friendly. And part of what we need to do is, is change those perceptions. You saw what the kids, you saw what the kids thought earlier. Um, I've described what some of the diversity challenges are in terms of the talent pool. So we need to broaden that talent pool significantly. And of course, attending Pride is just a public statement. It's not the be all and end all of our, our practices around LGBT plus inclusion. But being visible 
and inviting that community into HS2 to take advantage of the jobs and the business opportunities that's key for us. Um, if we could go on to the next slide. So again, um, as we talked about earlier, the talent issues um, and the talent pool challenges for the construction sector. And HS2 works with a number of partners to deliver a program. Women into Construction is another one um, where we invite a number of women to work experience opportunities, employability training, work placements. Um, and over half of the participants receive offers of employment, 75% of which come from our contractors. This year, we fine tune that, we're expanding that, and we expect these programs um, to become more and more popular across our supply chain. We have very specific diversity and inclusion requirements, as well as specific skills, employment, and education requirements, which are part of their contract. So they're contractual requirements that they have to fulfill. As the project matures, the overall approach of the supply chain matures to come with us as well. Um, if you could move on to the next slide. So um, I said I'd talk a little bit about our response to Black Lives Matter and the killing of, of George Floyd. Um, when, when that happened, um, HS2 didn't rush out to, to put a, a big public statement um, on, on a website or all across social media, anything like that. We took our time and had a considered response. Um, I wrote an article internally for our interchange, which has recognized that, um, recognized the mood um, and, uh, of the movement and understanding what people were seeing, reaffirming our commitment to EDI and making it really clear where we'd been successful and where we had more to do. Um, that article generated a huge response rate from across the, the company, three or four times what you would normally, normally see. And our CEO followed that up in his monthly uh, message um, and invited people to come and talk uh, to him and give them the benefit of their lived experience, not only at HS2, but otherwise. And a number of BANE staff did that. Having had those conversations and talked with our staff network, um, we decided to hold a series of book clubs, initially for our senior leadership team and then to roll out across the organization. And that was for people to discuss some of the concepts in, in the book by Renietta Lodge and have a wider conversation about Black Lives Matter, about inclusion, about what our BAME colleagues um, feel uh, and their experiences at, at, at both in work and outside of work. And we also had a courageous conversation um, session which allowed people again to discuss their experience and the sort of allyship required. Um, those sessions have been e extremely impactful and um, the um, through Race Equality Week, um, the, the whole organization on a voluntary basis has been able to attend those book clubs and have the, uh, and have the discussion. They were voluntary for our senior leadership as well, but the board, the executive, um, and um, pretty much all of the senior leadership team have had their book club discussion and found it very informative. And for us in the EDI team, it helps us understand where people are with some of the, uh, some of the issues raised. Um, if I could go on to the next slide. Right. Um, so this is one of the most popular programs at HS2. And this is a this is our reverse mentoring program. So this is a this is another program which was designed um, after our staff survey in 2016. 2016, we ran a staff survey, and to cut a long story short. Um, there was kind of lots to do around making the environment inclusive, but also um, there was particular feedback that leaders were not particularly accessible. People didn't think they had the opportunity to feed back to leaders and be open and challenging. Um, and as a result of that, we designed our reverse mentoring program, which um, pairs junior members of staff with members of the senior leadership team. And we do the matching very deliberately across diverse uh, diverse grounds. So, for example, um, our uh, our executive um, director of, uh, of community and stakeholder engagement, which includes corporate affairs, is paired um, with a with an employee who is hearing impaired. They can have discussion on accessible communications. People are paired across gender ethnicity lines and always across lines in the business. 
So, I mean, it's not feedback from people directly in your line, but from other areas of the business. Again, allowing an exchange of opinions, an exchange of experiences, uh, and also a sort of that kind of cross-education and cross-networking from across the business. This is a fundamental KPI for our senior leaders. This is part of our expectation. Um, now, I suppose we could have relied on evolution for people to naturally pick up conversations with diverse people at different levels across different areas of the business, or we could have moved to a program design, which was deliberately designed to uh, improve some of the metrics we had in 2016. Now, this program isn't designed um, as a promotion program. It's around exchange of experiences, uh, uh, around exchanges of perspectives, and taking actions which have, which have a sort of impact on culture. Yet, after um, two and a half years, 56% um, of people that have been into the reverse mentoring program have had a promotion or two. So again, by developing that sort of network across the organization and a network of, of sort of reverse mentors, people are more aware of opportunities to develop themselves and move on. Um, if I could go to the next slide. So um, in thinking about all of, of what I've said, um, you might be asking, well, what's the kind of proof in the pudding? You know? How diverse is your workforce after all this sort of work that you've been doing? And the good news is that compared to um, the infrastructure industry, we are a significantly more diverse organization. 39% of our employees are women compared to 21% in the sector. 22% BAME representation compared to six in the sector. 26% um, disability and adjustment compared to 2% in the sector. So the actions that we have been taking over the last five years since 2016 have led to an increase in diversity. And I'll talk about the improvement in inclusive culture too. Um, I'll just stop and take a couple of questions there. So we have a lot of activity in our place of work. However, it's, it's reaching the people that don't readily participate as they are often the disruptors, if that's the right word. Yes, and this is, um, that's, that's a good point. Staff networks can often um, operate as an echo chamber. And by that, I mean the BAME employees are talking to BAME employees and et cetera for the other groups. The way we tackle that is um, not only because sort of, you know, we have our values moments and this, that, and, that, and the other, but every single employee at HS2 has an EDI objective. And at a staff level, that EDI objective is around participation. And a minimum requirement is that staff participate in at least one EDI engagement activity during the year. That might be a book club, it might be a network event. We have um, DNI games, word searches, etc., that people can play in team meetings. And what that does is it, it, it encourages whole teams of people to then choose an activity they're going to engage in and then word of mouth spreads. Um, we also have a, a very popular uh, workshop called the Inclusion Experience, which boils down the feeling of being included or excluded into a sort of a two-minute uh, sort of emotional impact. Um, and uh, obviously, if you, if you tell everybody about what happens at the workshop, you kind of ruin the surprise. And that in itself creates a kind of insiders and outsiders group, those who have been on it and know the secret and, and those who haven't been on it yet. And that really drives engagement. People really want to, really want to, uh, to come to it. And then, of course, we use all of those mechanisms to kind of promote a kind of more inclusive culture and get people participating. And again, we're very explicit about that. Whether you agree, whether you disagree, whether you think we're doing a great job as an organization or you think we're not doing a great job, your voice is very important. And we actively encourage that participation. Um, the second one is people with lived experience of discrimination and trying to overcome lack of access privilege. How do we keep ourselves safe and mentally well while doing this work? How do we avoid being overwhelmed? That's a very good question. Um, you know, in HS2, we've gone a long way to creating a safe space. And that safe space is driven by a number of things, our organizational values, but also the evidence that we have. 
So we're not talking to people about privilege or about doing more of this or, or less of that without the data to support us. And that kind of data-driven insight really helps you move that sort of conversation uh, along. Really good question. How many of the 22% BME representation is at senior levels in the organization? It's an excellent question. So HSD doesn't select our board. Um, and on the board, we don't have any BAME representation. Around 10% of our senior leadership um, team are BAME. And that, that is increasing around about 1%, uh, about 1 a year. And that's pretty standard for diverse groups across our organization. So each year, at each management level, we increase by about 1%. So we certainly have more work to do. Um, and the leadership framework that we've introduced as a recruitment tool um, and a development tool is, is certainly helping that mix progress. Um, what is unconscious bias in training? Can you recommend it? So um, there is no doubt that unconscious bias training splits opinion. And I'll just give you the benefit of my opinion, and it is my opinion. Um, unconscious bias training is a very useful tool for engaging people. Um, to get them to understand what unconscious bias is, how we, uh, how we make implicit associations, and that drives decision making, and all sorts of good stuff. But it is not the answer to changing the results. And if you want to change the results around diversity and inclusion, you have to change the process, the evaluation mechanisms, and the decision making points. And if you change those three parts, then your progress will be far, far quicker than um, if you rely on training. Training alone will not change. How are the EDI percentages worked out by actual workforce or the wider community that it represents? So those EDI, um, those EDI percentages are the HS2 workforce, and that's compared to the infrastructure industry. We could go further and compare it to um, the community that we represent. Um, or the communities that we are in up and down the, the roof. Um, HS2 is a national project, so you could compare it to the national percentages, workforce percentages. You could compare it to industry. You could compare it to London, Birmingham, and Manchester, etc. Um, there's no right or wrong answer. You want to, you want you want the answer which is which is right for which is right for you and your organization. And of course. Um, depending on where you measure against, it will be closer or further away from the target. But looking at the industry that we're in, the talent pool that we have to select from at this point, and considering where we are in the country, allows us um, allows us to look at how we uh, how we measure those percentages. But the percentages that are on the screen, those are the HS2 workforce, and compared to the infrastructure industry, to give you an example of how our EDI practices have enabled us to increase the diversity of our organization compared to the diversity in the sector at all, which is um, by no means saying uh, that it is perfect. Um, okay, if we could move on to the next slide. Great. So I wanted to talk to you about, um, about culture for uh, uh, a second. So 2016, when we ran our staff survey, right when we were sort of going into our, our developing our EDI strategy, um, there was lots of feedback. Um, there was lots of feedback about um, uh, how much we had to do to in, improve to sort of the culture at HST. And I, I hope everything that I've been talking to you uh, about today gives you um, some kind of uh, flavor that um, gives you some kind of flavor uh, about what we've done and how we've tried to deliver that change, not by, um, not by sort of corporate statements of good intent, but by actively disrupting and changing the way we do things, how we communicate, how we engage. Um, we ran our last engagement survey uh, about a month ago, a month and a half ago, an 82 response rate, nearly, uh, nearly sort of 1,700 odd, odd people. Um, and we asked our staff to describe the company culture in three words. And um, they could choose any three words to write. There were no options for this. And inclusive came back 
as the word that was most used and by some distance. So it does go to show that if you take an approach to diversity and inclusion, which is data and insight and feedback led, you can shift the dial. It also goes to underline that the dial doesn't shift overnight. We've had a five year EDI strategy, which has been very successful and has delivered the outcomes that we have wanted. Um, but that has taken a lot of hard work across all areas of, of the business. Um, if we go on to the next slide. So it's not just us. HS2 um, works, with a, works with a large supply chain and we have a significant amount of public procurement money. And we have probably the most advanced um, uh, inclusive procurement and um, uh, EDI contract requirements in the country. And we also work with our, um, we also work cross sector with our other client partners, so Highways England, Transport for London, Network Rail. We are, we are aligning supplier requirements across our sector, primarily because it's better for those organizations which work for all of us. But in the long term, we'll be able to undertake far more strategic initiatives on a sector-wide basis to drive the type of changes we all need. Um, in the short sort of time that we've been working together about two years actively on a sort of standardizing, if you like, the approach around diversity and inclusion, We've, we've had a couple of successes. Um, we've aligned our EDI reporting requirements. So if you're working for Highways England, TFL, National Rail, or HS2, as your contract shifts and change, and, um, we will have alignment of the data that's submitted. We've developed a joint digital platform so that um, we can have a look at the sector every year in terms of contract diversity and how that's working. We can identify particular areas to improve on in about, uh, in a, about a week, actually. We're meeting to decide what are the strategic sort of talent level um, interventions that we need across the sector. And we'll start those initial conversations. And as the year develops and we get to the next insight session, we'll look to have an agreed approach across sector, which we can start to work on. And we recognize the challenge for our SMEs, so our tier twos, and we've created a joint learning pathway in partnership with the Supply Chain Sustainability School, which means if you're an SME supplier to any of the client organizations in the sector, you can undertake a joint learning pathway, which gives you free training in all the relevant areas of EDI that you will need to be able to put into your bid, so it'll help you win bid, win bids, um, and also assist you in meeting the contractual requirements that you're likely to get when you work with an organization like HS2, National Rail, TFL, or, or Highway Linger. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. So I think, um, I think I'll, I'll finish here and then take, um, and take a number of, of questions if you like. And that is um, EDI is central to the success of HS2 not just about the communities that were hugely important, but changing the actual makeup of the sector. And we can see the organizations that we, uh, that we work with, our supply chain, are beginning to win EDI awards for the work that they're doing based on HS2 requirements. We can see that starting to shift um, with sort of the quality of EDI practices and our supply chain are starting to achieve um, those uh, EDI accreditation. 75% of our construction tier ones have achieved their accreditation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's, it is fundamentally important to delivering the benefits of HS2. So it is, it is definitely um, embedded across all areas of HS2, our workforce, our supply chain, the design of our stations and, and, and trains, and also the communities we engage with because it is fundamental to the success of HS2. Um, if I could have the, the next slide, which I think is just Q&A. Um, brilliant, so I'm happy to take um, questions as they come up. I see a couple, so maybe I'll answer these and then um, we can open up. Such a multi-layered issue, great initiatives and strategies gain hearts and minds, et cetera, et cetera. If you had just one piece of advice on the starting point to deliver change, what would it be? Um, 
the starting point. The starting point for us at HS2 was understanding the narrative. And uh, I'm going to give you an example of, of that. The narrative for us was that there is a shrinking talent pool, more investment, and we needed more people. And thinking about diversity and inclusion um, was an avenue to get more people. So it wasn't a threatening message. It wasn't you have to lose for someone else to, to, to take advantage of the opportunity. And that was the starting point, is that we're all in it together. We do this well together. We just need more people because there are more opportunities. So that was the starting point, getting the narrative right. And that was linked to our strategic business case. After that, it becomes data and insights, making smart decisions, aligning program design to key pinch points around recruitment, talent, development, retention, etc. That you can demonstrate that you are changing things and then involving people in those conversations. Um, that is that's been critical to our success, but that starting point is, was our narrative. How do we make this something that everybody gets something out of if everybody participates in it? Um, how should the role of representative business organizations like TVPP as well as national sector bodies evolve to accelerate change on the DNI agenda? Um, great question. I'm going to give you a really simple answer to this. Um, um, set it as an expectation. If they're getting funding from you or support from you, then make sure that that is built into your requirements. Um, that is the easiest and quickest method to getting there. Um, in HS2, when we went out to do our major procurement, we understood um, through research the difference between winning and losing a major contract or winning and coming second, if you like that better, um, is around three and four, around, around three to four percent. The, um, the case for diversity inclusion or the technical scores for diversity inclusion and skills employment education are set higher than that. And therefore that gives any bidding organization the business case for diversity and, and skills. So that expectation creating the business case, extremely important. Um, I think that's the last question that I have. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to everyone who submitted questions. I think we had well over a dozen there that Mark's managed to get through and, and given some fantastic advice on. Um, uh, with that, I think um, I just want to say a very quick thank you to Mark um, for leading a fantastic session. I've seen lots of notes in the chat um, saying thank you as well. Um, and of course, thank you um, to those of you who participated, put your questions in the chat. Um, come along or virtually come along to today's session um, and thank you to our headline sponsors of Growth Through People, Aston University, BMET and the University of Birmingham's Work Inclusivity Research Centre. Just to note some upcoming Growth Through People events, we have um, Supporting and Pipeline of Female Talent tomorrow with Louise Tabor and Pam Shima from NatWest or Louise Tabor from Common Purpose and Pam Shima from NatWest. We also have a panel discussion with the University of Birmingham's Business Club on the 18th of March, which our Chief Strategy Officer and incoming CEO, Henrietta Brealey, will be speaking on about what the future of work might look like post-COVID. Um, next week we have, uh, or next week is themed around harnessing resilience. So we have a workshop on harnessing resilience for future challenges with BHSF and Wesleyan and a session on leading for growth with Stuart Bailey and Andrew from Curium Solutions. So if any of those sound of interest, please do register your place. And of course, we have Growth Through the Conference on the 30th of March, which is now free for anyone to attend. The whole aim of the conference and Growth Through People more broadly is to help local firms boost productivity and grow and thrive through what are of course some very challenging times at the moment um, by improving leadership and people management skills in areas such as diversity and inclusion, as we've spoken about today, um, as well as responsible leadership, attracting and engaging talent and more. We've got some fantastic keynote speakers lined up alongside panels, uh, workshops, and some very exciting, um, should I say top secret, refocusing exercises um, to keep you engaged throughout. So if you haven't got your place, I highly encourage you to. 
And then finally, if you can spare five minutes to complete that survey that I mentioned at the start, it would be hugely appreciated and we'll send you that link in the post events email. Thank you ever so much and a huge thank you to you, Mark, for giving up your time to lead the session. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I mean, as you'll have seen from the chat, lots of people took a lot away from it. So thank you ever so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Cheers.